Welcome to the Round 6 Podcast, a weekly roundtable discussion featuring a variety of automotive subjects, interviews, special guests, and stories, hosted by the Round 6 Gearheads, Brian Stupski, Alex Welsh, and Brad King. On episode 25, we take a few minutes to catch up with Mopar Fanatic, TV host, and all-around nice guy, our friend Chris Jacobs. Hey, two, one. Nice. Yeah. Counted us in. Hey, welcome to the Round 6 Podcast. I'm Brian. Brad. I'm Alex. And with us tonight is a guy who most of our listeners will probably know him from his time on Overhauling, but he's... Gosh, he's done just about everything. With us tonight, we have a, a guy who is an Aquarius. He's a Mopar fan. He loves golf and is a friend to woodland creatures everywhere, Mr. Chris <laughs> Jacobs. Yay! Hey! Hey! Yay. What that is awesome. the sound of one hand clapping, hey. right? <laughs> you guys being on time, it is approximately 6.09 right now. So, yes, around 6. Way to go, guys. Around 6. Around 6. <laughs> <laughs> it used to be how many of us would show up but we're not going to get into that uh so we uh we haven't seen you man since uh what the sema show last year that's right yeah last november so it's uh it's been it's been a while but it's good to be here with you guys and likewise as well I, mean, I should have said the guys haven't seen you since the sema show last year we uh we picked up a sponsor it's an optics company and thanks to the TSP 7411XR Mark V, or as it's more commonly known on peepercreepers.com, the Friendmaker <laughs> Telescope, uh, I've seen you quite often. <laughs> uh, so that's you? That's you? <laughs> that's you. Oh, oh, I saw a reflection. My, my lawyer advised me to end this conversation. Uh, <laughs> I found that out. So, guys, good luck to you. <laughs> hey, it's shortest episode ever. 25 is out the door. So. God, that, I no editing that required. Was just, you know, a sniper rifle off in the distance. But, okay, good to know that you've been watching. Hey, thank you very much. I mean, I guess as long as you're watching, I should be happy. Hey, big fan, right? That's how it goes. <laughs> but, no, you were, you were kind enough last year. Uh, you took a couple of us up in the crow's nest, uh, up, in the, up by the velocity stage. Um, man, it was, it was a really good time, you know, I wanted yeah. to thank you for that. That was really cool. And you, oh. uh, you even recorded an intro for our podcast that, uh, we, I'll be honest, we have hoard the living shit out of, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I should have taken another, uh, pass at it because, um, I, I had a slight stumble and I'm a perfectionist. So, you know, I, I, I like making my, uh, my work, uh, as clean as possible, especially when I'm insulting you. So, um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I wish I had another pass at it, but it was my pleasure to do that for you guys. You'll have more chances to insult us. So oh, don't, good. don't worry about that. that. <laughs> Work on your lines. <laughs> that was just the first one. Yeah, exactly. I was, I was off the cuff, so you can't expect perfection. So what have you been up to lately? I mean, I know you, you, you've got some time off now, so you're kind of hanging yep. out. We are talking. You're, uh, you're enjoying one of your passions in life. You're playing some golf. Yeah. What else is going on in Chris Jacobs' world? Um, well, right now I'm in between seasons on my TLC show, Long Lost Family, um, which we are getting ready to shoot season four of. Uh, I'm very proud of that show. If you don't know what it is, it's a, a show where we reunite people who were adopted with their birth families, whether it be their parents or their siblings or or uh, any blood relative that they've been searching for. So that's a very rewarding project for me because – that's my story. I was adopted and I reconnected with my birth family when I was 23 years old. And wow. it's been a great experience for me. So it's kind of my honor to be able to help other people have that similar experience in their lives. So again, something I'm really proud of. If you haven't checked it out, um, definitely do so. TLC. And uh, there, there's some kind of crazy parallels between long lost family and overhauling. There's a um, Someone's looking for something, uh, they find that, and they're reunited, and then there's an emotional beat to it where that, you know, reconnection is established. So on overhauling, it was obviously 
the person and their car. And in Long Lost Family, it's the person and whoever they were looking for. So it, it's kind of cool that it's a completely different genre of a show, but very similar um, in the, the emotional impact that the show has. And it, it, it's, you know, because I love cars and also am adopted myself and love the experience of being reconnected with my birth family, I'm able to, um, you know, relate to the people on the show in a very meaningful way. Right on. I got to tell you, it, it's a great show. I, uh, I've been watching it. I, I, I can't say enough good things about it, man. It's, it's really cool. And it was, it's, it's interesting to see you in kind of a, I don't want to say a different role. Cause I mean, you're, you're you obviously on the show, right. but it's just kind of weird. I mean, it, it's you, but it, it's you on just a whole other level. It's kind of cool to watch. Yeah. It's me without a hat. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're it's acapella different, in that one. Different nice. context. You know, but yeah, I mean, thank you very much for, for saying so. And, uh, you know, it's, it's amazing when I'm at car events, the amount of people and car guys who come up to me and tell me that they love long lost family and love watching it. And, and not just because their wives watch it, but because they really feel the emotional impact of it themselves. So it's, it's a great compliment to me when fellow gearheads, uh, compliment me on long lost family. That's it's awesome. such a fascinating show, and, and I can't even imagine the logistics it takes to put something like that together. If you think about it, some of these people have been looking for their family forever, yeah. and I can imagine that they've probably exhausted most of the uh, methods that they had to try to find that, but you guys have a way, and you guys are able to dig deep, and it's it's a fascinating concept. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, like they used to say on the X-Files, the truth is out there, and uh, you just got to be able to... Uh, look for it with proper resources and also the the timing thing is really big you know it happens for people in their lives when it's supposed to happen um, uh, I, I always tell people that um, who say to me like I've been looking forever and I haven't been able to find them well perhaps the timing wasn't right for your life perhaps you weren't ready for it emotionally and and when we do reconnect people they are ready for it emotionally and most of the time it's a, a very positive thing for them and, and turns out to be a great experience it's kind of a tearjerker thing which which is always kind of cool you go from the you know the, the day of like being grumpy going all right i need some a little i need a little emotional thing to kind of shake it up a little bit and that's a good show for that i like that yeah totally and i mean so that's you know that's what's been going on as far as current projects that i'm working on but i'm also of course, still very active in the car world. I'm getting ready for the next uh, Barrett Jackson, which happens in uh, Las Vegas at the end of September, and very excited about that. I love Barrett Jackson. I mean, you guys have been to a Barrett Jackson, I'm sure. It is oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. absolutely nirvana for a car guy because it's essentially <laughs> a car show where every single car that's there is as nice as it can possibly be because it's getting ready to go across the auction block. And, you know, I get to just walk around and drool on these cars and talk about them and meet people and hang out with fellow gearheads and car lovers. And the fact that I get paid to do that is, is you know, <laughs> I got to pinch myself every time I'm walking around. <laughs> it's, really incredible. it's awesome. Yeah, we've got one right in my backyard in Scottsdale. So, yeah, that's the granddaddy right there. Scottsdale is absolutely incredible. You are you're a blast to watch on that show. Yep. Thanks. Yeah, it's, it's fun. It's so much fun. I mean, you know, we have a great team, Christy Lee and Steve Magnante and uh, Rick DeBrule and Mike Joy. And we, we, we have other Velocity talent come in and, and kind of guest host with us. We've had Mike and Ant from Wheeler Dealers and uh, um, uh, Ralph Holguin from RMD Garage. Uh, so it's so fun to just – it's a free-for-all. I mean, they, they basically give us a mic and a camera and they send us on our way. And we just walk around the show and find a cool car and we, you know, radio back to the booth. Hey, I want to talk about XYZ car. And they say, okay, you know, you're coming up in two minutes and there you go. And we just, it, it all comes from the heart and we all love cars equally. And, and it's nice to hear you say that, that it's fun to watch because that's really what we're trying to provide is a, is a conduit for the audience to kind of be at the Barrett Jackson experience. And if you haven't been to a Barrett Jackson, you should definitely check one out because if you love cars, I mean, man, it is just the place to be when they're going on. It's so much fun. It's worth it. It's a it's a totally different um, environment than going to like a car show. There's so much going on. Yeah. And what's interesting when you mentioned the team on that, and you got a guy okay, like you bring a really cool, personable. You're kind of like 
the dude you hang out with from the car club every week. And then you've got on the other side, you got Steve Magnante, who I, I spent a lot of road time with that guy. And we did a lot of stuff on a on a Dodge road trip. And that dude, how do you he has literally literally written the book on the subject, you know, and not and not just Mopar. He's mostly known for Mopar, but he's also written books uh, books around Chevy and and uh, and Ford too. So he knows his stuff backwards and forwards. And he's got this little notebook that he uses, like a little <laughs> pad that he literally does the research on every single car that's on the docket. He's got notes written out for every single one. And when it rolls up on the, on the, on the, the, you know, the stage, he knows these little tidbits about every one of these cars. I mean, I'm in awe of this guy's knowledge. If my, if my, you know, if, if total car knowledge is one to 100, I'm probably operating at around a 27. He's up <laughs> in the nineties. He's like, he's, he's a savant. I love Steve Magnante with all my heart. He is. He's a total savant. And, and the, the best thing about Magnante is you can really feel the love of the car coming out of him. I mean, he, he lives this life. He is not faking it in any sense of the word. He loves cars. He bleeds it. I will tell you, uh, you know, we won't put this on the air. I will share a photo of him with you on his front lawn. Um, as someone who's been to his house... It is like it's like a thirteen-year-old car guy's wonderland, but I mean, we're not here to talk about that. It's just it's it is more model cars and Hot Wheels cars and magazines than you could ever imagine Loves. in one place. But yeah, it's like the Hanson brothers from Slapshot, you know? They brought, <laughs> he brought his toy. That's my Dante, you know. <laughs> so going back now. How did you how did you get into cars? What what was like the genesis of your immersion into the whole car thing? Well, my dad and my brothers always had cool cars when I was growing up. My dad was a big Porsche guy. He always had 911s when I was growing up and um that's kind of what what made me a 911 fanatic. I mean, as much of a Dodge fanatic as I am, I'm also a 911 guy. I have an 85 911. Um, I love, love, love Porsche. I love the history of Porsche. Um, so my dad always had Porsches. My brother Clay had, uh, a, a, a Trans Am and my brother Zach had a Pontiac GTO convertible. He had a 66 GTO convertible. And those, Ooh. like, those cars just were like burned into my mind. I just, I knew they were cool. I didn't know about them very much, but I knew that they were cool. Um, so as I got older, I just, you know, paid more attention to cars and I just, for some reason, you know, it's, it's like art. You can't describe what kind of art you like. You just know that you like it. And that's how it was for me with cars. And, and I liked muscle cars in particular. And, uh, as I got older, I just kind of became more and more of a car fan. And then very early in my acting career, um, I was sent on an audition for this show called Overhaul. And uh, with this guy named Chip Foos. And I had no idea who Chip Foos was. And I Googled him and uh, kind of got a sense of who he was. And I went on the audition. And um, I remember that I was leaving that afternoon to go to Las Vegas for my buddy's bachelor party. So I was in a very kind of loose and happy mood. And also, it was for the role of the host. And at the time, I was an actor. And I was like, I'm an actor. I'm not a host, you know, whatever. So I was just kind of just loose and, and being goofy. And um, Courtney was there, who was my original co-host on Overholland, and we had a little chemistry test. And then they had a card table that had a bunch of different car parts on the table. And they were like, well, let's see what you know about cars. You know, what can you identify on this, on this table? And I was like, well, that's a distributor cap, and that's an air cleaner, and that's a spark plug. And, you know, like two days later, my agent's like, you got the job. And I was like, okay, that's great. I still didn't know what it was quite going to be. So first episode we shot down at Alan Budnick's shop down in Huntington Beach. And it was literally like a team of seven guys. And we rebuilt that 71 Malibu in a week. And it was an incredible experience to watch these guys work and rebuild this car. And we were still kind of finding our way with the show. And uh, we didn't really know what it was at the time. And in fact, during during the week, they asked us to, you know, kind of 
get into a fight because Orange County Choppers was on at the time, and they kind of liked the fact that those guys would argue all the time. And Chip and I looked at each other, and Chip was like, no, you know, that's that's not really kind of what this is all about. I'm not really a guy who fights. If there's an issue, we just solve the problem. So that really set the tone for the show, and that gave us an attitude, an overall attitude. Like, we're going to have fun. We're going to build these cars, and we're going to have fun. And that really freed me up to – turn into the goofball that I guess I turned into on the show uh, through my pranks and things like that. We really didn't know quite what our roles were at the time, but we felt our way along. We did seven episodes in the first season. Um, they ordered 15 episodes for the second season. And then in the third season, we did 29 episodes. And uh, so we were doing literally a week on, week off in the third season. And by that time, you know, our roles were pretty well established. And we just we just caught lightning in a bottle. I mean, Overhauling was like no other show I've ever been on and no other show that I've seen since. We kind of established that car makeover genre. And I'm glad that they gave us the chance to let us be ourselves because I think that the camaraderie that we had, particularly between me and Foos and also with the crews, the various A-teams that we had, we really kind of – caught lightning in a bottle and, and people really responded to it. But it all trickled down from Chip's attitude. Chip really set the tone for what Overhauling was and what it became and ultimately what it's known for. It's, it's Chip Foose's humor. It's his personality. Um, I kind of provided the, the fodder, but Chip is really the talent on that show. And I, I'm just so happy that I was able to – you know, be there with them the whole the whole time. I mean, I'm so proud of that show. It was such a great experience doing overhaul for all those years. That's if, outstanding. <clears throat> yeah, if you go back to the start when you were talking about the start of that and, and they wanted the drama and you guys refused, that's why that show became what it was. There, yeah. there was no, there was no drama. The, the show was the show. It, there wasn't this, let's make fighting and somebody's going to get yelled at. There, there was no reason to have that. It was, everybody was having fun trying to accomplish the same thing. So it served no point in even doing that, which is why the show became so huge. Yeah, there was no, you know, they really, they, they looked at, at, and again, I'll use Orange County Choppers as an example, because really back in, in those days, that was the only kind of automotive show that was on. You had American Hot Rod and American Choppers, and that was pretty much it. And so they, they looked at the success that, that the Tuttles were having fighting with each other, and they're going, well, you guys should fight too. And we were like, no, we, we really just want to have fun and be goofy and make people laugh as opposed to kind of, you know, make people say, whoa, these guys are going to have a fist fight. So the pranks became kind of more and more outrageous. And I was able to play all these goofy characters and use a bunch of voices on the phone. And it, it really just became a fun time. And the overall emotion became a positive in that we were – changing these people's lives for the better. You know, they, they thought that their car was gone or they thought that their car was never going to be made for And then we give them essentially a show car and they're so happy. It just, that, that really became kind of like the theme. Like we're going to mess with you for a week, but in the end you're going to get this incredible car back and you're going to be really happy and all is going to be well. So it just, the format just worked and we just kept doing it again and again and again and kind of refined it, and got better and better at it. So as I said, I mean, the experience was just incredible. I mean, it changed my career, it changed my life. I mean, that's what I'm known for. That will always be my calling card. <clears throat> this day I get people coming up to me saying, you know, hey, can I get my car and overhaul? And I have to say, well, we're not making the show anymore, but we'll put you on the list just in case. <laughs> Stand by. Okay, now I got I got to ask you an overhauling question that uh, a mutual friend of ours uh, kind of threw at me. We were, we were talking. Um, he's he's an agent marketing guy that we both know well. On one of your episodes of overhauling, there was there was kind of a scary a scary deal, and uh, and it, it didn't come out on the show, but it was one of those deals where a where a gun was involved. Yeah. Um, I, I want <laughs> I, I heard a little bit about it through uh, through our friend Carson. So I kind of wanted to hear your your take on how it went down because nobody really ever talked about it. So I'm just kind of curious. It was pretty crazy. Um, it was the uh, the the Cadillac episode, um, which turned out to be one of the most beautiful cars that uh, we ever built 
absolutely incredible build. But when we were originally taking the car, um, the person who we were taking the car from was a LAPD officer. And they're always armed, whether they're on duty or they're not. So the prank was that I was going to be towing the car. And while I was towing it, we were going to hear some commotion in the trunk of the car. And what it was, was we had Chip Foose all duct taped up in the trunk of the car. And he was going to, like, <laughs> right? Like, like, like inane. We had really run out of ideas by this point. <laughs> so, you know, we're, we're towing the car and uh, we hear the commotion in the trunk. And I'm like, you know, what's that? And uh, the, this, the cop's like, you know, what's that? So. I go to open the trunk and he motions for me to stop before I open the trunk and he pulls out his gun and starts pointing it at the trunk. And so now I'm like, whoa, wait a second. <laughs> this is really real now. Okay. So I, you know, you know, I, I get the word in my ear from the producers to just go ahead and open the trunk. So I open the trunk and, uh, Chip pops up and he's got a Foose t-shirt on and, and thank God the, the LAPD officer recognized him because he's a fan of the show and um, no shots were fired. But uh, we actually had, yeah, a live live gun uh, on the set. And, so did, uh, did, did Chip have stunt poop or was it uh, his, his real poop when this went down? No, Chip is one of the most... <laughs> unflappable guys on the planet like uh he just he rolls with the punches and um you know that guy that guy who uh, owns overhauled caddy um actually uh, is a is a buddy of ours now we hang out with him quite a bit so um he he just was protecting himself you know uh, I, I think the lapd officers are very well trained they're not going to shoot um, and then ask questions. They're going to assess the situation, and that's what he did. And he saw Fusi's shirt and recognized what the situation was. So, but yeah, he pulled his gun, and it was a, a little touch and go there for for a couple minutes. Uh, definitely one of the more interesting moments on uh, on Over Holland for sure. But everyone was safe in the end. It was okay. No uh, no depends were soiled. <laughs> Yeah, because we had a little side bet going here. We were talking, we were trying to figure out if it was like how bad that would be if it was burrito day over in the <laughs> services that day. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It probably could have gotten a little messy. But, you know, like like I said, Chip is unflappable. I mean, he's really just incredible. Like, he didn't miss a beat. I was way more um, affected by the situation than he was. Uh, you might think it would probably be the opposite. Um, but yeah, I, I just, I really didn't know what was going to happen, but I, I knew it was going to be good TV. That's for sure. This was all those years of chip being a gang member, you know, paid off finally. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Loco chip. <laughs> <laughs> hey, chip rhymes with crip. So, you know, <laughs> the chips and the bloods. <laughs> I think he wore mauve or something. You yeah, were that, was off the evil gang out of Solvang. <laughs> <laughs> but hey, but but shout out, shout out to our buddy Scott, who is the LAPD officer and owner of Overhauled Caddy, uh, that he was, um, you know, uh, uh, wise enough to protect himself and also wise enough to uh, not shoot Chip. So that was good. Thank you for that, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> Could have changed automotive history. <laughs> that changed us a lot. Yeah. Exactly. How horrible would that have been if they would have brought in one of the Tuttles to replace him? Oh man, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I'm not so sure that that would have worked. <laughs> that would have been a great crossover. Thinking about it, you guys, yeah. imagine you guys overhauling one of their things. That's sort of been spectacular. The arguments, <laughs> the drama. Nah, <laughs> I'm not. Really I'm not so out. sure Chip would have gone for that. You know, um, I'm, I'm buddies with Paul Jr. I like him a lot. Uh, we, 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 we actually talked about the possibility of doing a little, little crossover, but, um, I think everybody agreed that, uh, you know, we should just remain autonomous. Uh, we did, we actually did one crossover on Overhauling and that was with Miami Inc. Um, Ami James, who's, uh, one of the private, I think the owner of the tattoo shop in Miami 
we we did a little bit of work to his car, and then he actually tattooed me um, with a design that Chip made. So it was kind of a cool little smorgasbord of, of people on the show. And um, it's, it's a really cool piece of art, too. It's up on my Instagram if anybody wants to see uh, the tattoo that I have between my shoulder blades. But it's a Chip design tattooed by Ami James, and we did a little bit of work on his. I think it was a Camaro. Um, but that was the one crossover episode that we did. Very so did cool. he get the, did he get the foo signature correct on your tattoo? So it has the, the whole chip. signature is not on. The tattoo. <laughs> but, uh, I have met guys who've had chips, tat, uh, chip signature tattooed on them. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So that's, that's hardcore right there. Yeah. We need to have a game on this show from now on to be like, what would be the worst autograph tattoo to have on your body? And where? <laughs> yeah, where is more important. <laughs> well, we know uh, you're a so, Porsche guy. We know he's a Dodge guy. And there's a there's a GM car that snuck in there that Carson was talking about. Okay. Yeah, well, you know, my dream car in high school was the Grand National. And so um, last year at uh, Barrett-Jackson Northeast, um, right before we came on the air, we were doing sound checks, and I was up on – stage and here comes this grand national rolling across the stage in 87 which was my preferred year and the bidding kind of stalled out at twelve thousand dollars and i was like you know uh wait a second this is way too much of a bargain so i raised my hand at you know twelve five and um i think the bidding went a little bit further i can't remember exactly what i got it for i think like maybe around 17 or so uh, and I was the proud new owner of an 87 Grand National, and I'll tell you what, I could not be happier because I love that car. I got all the receipts with it, and the guy had spent like nine or ten grand restoring it, so I got a I got a pretty Jeez. good deal. Oh, and wow. the best thing the best thing about this Grand National is that it has a magic radio, and what I mean by that is every time I start the car, it's on this radio station here in LA that's like uh, kind of like a classic rock station and I kid you not every single time I start that car it's playing like Cheap Trick or Bon Jovi <laughs> or AC <laughs> some song some classic song from the 80s is blasting it's got <clears throat> amazing speakers so I turn it up as loud as I can get it and it's just it's amazing I love that car it, it, <laughs> pick up, it picks up KMET it's like the only one around that actually still right. does that Exactly. Yeah, it's a, even though <laughs> it still plays KME too. <laughs> so what what made you decide what what was the deal with just having to have an eighty seven versus you know, you know any I other was year? A junior in high school in eighty seven and it's the last year of the Grand National and um I've always been a fan of that car. Of course I would love to have a GNX, but I can't afford them anymore. They've they've skyrocketed in value. Um but the the Grand National just just spoke to me. I mean, it's it's Darth Vader's muscle car, um, and it, they just look so cool. You know, everything blacked out, and the cool wheels, and the real kind of very Spartan GM interior that they used in every single car. You know, all the the, the speedos are the same, and the the, the 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 window operators and the door handles, everything the same uh, for GM cars during that era. Um, so I just, you know, it's it's a bucket list car that I that I love having, and every time I drive it, it gets looks, and it's the car. It's it's where it's valued. I don't have to worry about where I park it. Um, I can put as many miles on it as I want. It's got like eighty eight thousand miles on it, so I don't have to worry about you know mileage things like that. It's a great car. You know, I'll keep it for a few years and then I'll sell it. So it'll it'll be That's something that awesome. just comes through the collection. Yeah. The T types, the T types are actually even more rare, and they're faster than the Grand Nationals too. So, the T types are cool. I mean, they're just the, the the Regal body style is one of those those styles that are so bad they're good. You know, they're so ugly they're beautiful. Um, well, they're the gorgeous cars. Yeah, I, I just I've always loved that Regal body style, and and especially the Grand Nationals. So you know, when this one came across and at that at that price. Um, in fact, there was a 928, a white 928 that came across the stage right before that car. 
and I was thinking about buying that one, and that one got out of my price range. Then here comes a Grand National, and I was standing with Bob Scanlon, uh, the general manager of Velocity, and he said to me, he goes, haven't you always wanted a Grand National? There's one on the stage right now. So I turned around, and I just kind of, you know, deer in the headlights walked towards it and heard the price and raised my hand. And like I said, next thing you know, I'm, a, I'm the owner of a 87 Grand National. <laughs> <laughs> I could, I could awesome. save myself some shipping fees by buying it in Arizona or uh, or Vegas, but you know, of course, I buy it at one auction that's as far away from LA as you can possibly get. <laughs> of course, and, uh, I I have a thing for nine two eights as well, so I I would have been right there with you on that. Love man, I love if, those cars. If you can believe it, it's like the the nine twenty eight was the car that Porsche wanted to replace the 911 with. They were going to discontinue the 911 and have the 928 be its flagship model. And then, I can't remember the guy's name, but the Porsche had a new president who said, no, 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 no. The 911 is our bread and butter. We are keeping the 911. So fortunately for him, uh, he made that decision. But originally, they wanted the 928 to replace the 911 as, the, as, as Porsche's flagship model. And they are so cool. I just dig it. <laughs> Cool. Yeah, as uh, as Tom Cruise said in Risky Business, there is no substitute. <laughs> before it went underwater, before it became the German <laughs> U-boat into Lake Michigan. <laughs> so speaking of like, uh, you know, since everybody had to mention a lake, you grew up near Chicago, correct? I did indeed. Yeah, outstanding. So, it, now correct me if I'm wrong here. I know you've got a law degree and you've passed the California bar. Yep. On your first attempt, no less. Yes, indeed. My Damn, my dude. proudest accomplishment. <laughs> man, if amazing. you weren't so nice, man, you'd be the guy you just want to punch in the throat because you <laughs> 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 never practice though. You can't you can't hold the the lawyer thing against me. No, you know I I, I went to law school as a backup, um, just because uh, or in case entertainment didn't work out. And uh, fortunately, I never had to fall back on that uh, that backup of law, but. I really enjoyed law school. Law school was a lot of fun. You know, once you make it through the first semester, it's a lot like undergrad. So I was still living in Whittier, uh, hanging out with all my college friends, and um, made it through law school in two and a half years because I went two full summers. And then I took the bar in February of 1995, uh, incredibly 23 years ago. And I never practiced, so I, I have promptly forgotten everything there is to know about the law, except the definition of a tort. That is the one thing in law that I remember. <laughs> a tort is a civil wrong independent of contract. Wow. So, so there you go. Yeah. Thank you very much. That is the extent of my... Wow. Work. Hear that, Brian? See, it's, not a, it's not a Danish... This yeah. sucks. I say you and I have been using this word totally way wrong. <laughs> Completely wrong. <laughs> Completely yeah. incorrect on our usage. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, just because you're some man, you're you're the first real Mopar guy we've had on. Thank you for that. Oh, yeah. um, I'm I'm alone in this whole thing. I'm the only Mopar guy we have. But I have to ask you, uh, first Mopar you ever purchased. And oh, please say it's like an '86 Omni Horizon. <laughs> I, know. I wish, I wish it was that drastically cool. Um, my first <laughs> Mopar was a, a 1968 Plymouth Sport Fury convertible, and oh, uh, it had the original 383 Super Commando in it, the 727 Torque Flight transmission, and it was so big that I actually had to get a captain's license to drive it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, had to park it with a tugboat. Yeah, the, the speedometer read in knots instead of. <laughs> but uh, I loved that car so much. Um, the best part about that car was it always started. I could leave it in my garage for weeks, for months. It always started up, and it was such a cool, cool cruiser. It was sunlight yellow exterior with like a turtle green interior, and you know, I mean, Mopar. The reason I love Mopar so much is is the styling. And the style of that interior was just so cool, so unique, so very kind of art deco. And uh, I love that car. And um, I sold it to buy a 68 Charger RT. And then um, I sold that Charger RT to buy the Mopar that I still have today, which is a 68 GTX. 
um, that I bought from one of my best friends. And uh, I've had that car for probably 15 years. And um, it's been through uh, a paint job, an engine swap, interior, wheels, brakes, pretty much everything. So that car is as close to an overhauling car as you can get. Way cool. Actually being an overhauling, yeah. I keep joking with the guys. One of these days I'm going to put a mod top on my Challenger. <laughs> Is those I, were that's... those were really cool, uh, really cool options. By the way, You're talking about like the paisley or the flowered. Exactly, top. get that, that was an amazing the matching option. interior. Yeah, I get the matching pants too. What the hell? Grandma's <laughs> couch. <laughs> yeah, we saw the GTX at SEMA last year and got got a chance to take a look at it and see the crate uh, motor installation that Mark that's, did. Yep. and that was really cool. Nice, clean job. Very nice work. Cool. And, uh, well, what happened was I had an engine fire and, um, it melted the air cleaner and the underside of the fiberglass hood and all the hoses and everything. And it, it was just a mess. So I was saying to myself, you know, what can I do, uh, besides changing all the stuff that melted? And I remembered that Mark and his guys had done the swap on the CUDA with the 392 crate engine. So I called Mark Warman up at Graveyard Cars and I said, Hey, can you do that to the GTX? And he said, you know what? That's a really interesting idea for, an episode. So we got on the phone with Mopar and they were gracious enough to, uh, to, to send us an engine and Mark did the swap and they changed out the big block trans to the small block 727 trans and uh, Magnum Force put their front end on there. And then the kind of um, artistic uh, touch, I called my buddy Mike Lavalley at Killer Paint and he went down to Mark's shop and he airbrushed the underside of the new hood with this beautiful phoenix rising out of the flames to kind of commemorate the engine fire. Yeah, and it all just worked. I mean, there's there's pictures of it and video of it on my Instagram account, so you can check that out if you want. But I, I couldn't be happier with it. And the thing is just an absolute beast. Um, it's, and now it's bulletproof. I used to drive around watching the temp gauge, and now I watch uh, drive around just watching the smiles on other people's faces when they see it coming down the road because it's a gorgeous car. Foose paint job, foose wheels. Um, it's, it's just, it's awesome. I love driving it. What do, what do those engines make for horsepower? Uh, I want to say it's 460 at the, Ooh. at the wheels. Yeah. Nice. So it's, uh, it's, oh, it's got some real nice get up and go. Yeah. Oh yeah. Let's see it. Cause I think they're advertised at 485 at the crank and that's, that's no yeah. slouch. No, no, not at all. It's, it's, it's plenty. It's plenty. Let me just put it that way. <laughs> They've got a nice lopey idle from from the factory too. It's it's kind of it's a cool motor. Yeah, it's really good, and uh, it sounds great when it's idling, and and um, you know, it's I I couldn't be happier with the way it turned out. It's a it's a pleasure to drive, and now that it's reliable, you know, I can take it on long drives and uh, and not worry about it overheating or breaking down or anything like that, which I used to worry about a lot with the the clunky, hot running 440 that was under it, and it was not the original. 440. So, before any of you purists say that I, uh, you know, broke up a numbers matching car, I did not. Kudos to you, because yeah, you and I both know it's, and we're not going to pick on the Mopar people, because well, we're we're part of that family. But that's a that's a different breed when you get into numbers matching, and like even when you get to the point where it's like, oh, well, this guy restored this car, but he didn't put the the hair follicles into the paint <laughs> under the hood. Well, I used to, as everybody knows, you know, I used to, I used to love getting up on Sundays and watching dream car garage, uh, yeah, you know, yeah. Peter, Peter Clute show. And one of the things I loved about that show was how meticulous they were. And Mark Warman is now the same way, but how meticulous they were about getting it back to as if it rolled off the factory, uh, uh line and like they're down to the paint dabs and the chalk marks and, I just loved those touches. So that was definitely a consideration when I was um, uh, going to do the engine swap was the fact that there was, it was not the numbers matching 440 that was in the GTX. So I didn't have any qualms at all about uh, pulling that out of there and putting the 392. And thank you for driving it. Oh, yeah. No, you got to. You got to drive them all, especially the, uh, the Grand National, because every time I don't drive it for a couple of weeks, it literally bleeds. There is a uh, tranny fluid on my garage floor. <laughs> <laughs> it's bleeding horsepower. Just yeah, think about right. that way. It's bleeding horsepower. Marking its territory. 
those GM uh, those GMGs are, are notorious for that. I was going to say, Brad, you, you know about that. Yours doesn't bleed horsepower, though. Yours bleeds it something else all over the floor. It's a, it's a Chevy. It just leaks. So yeah. It's just a lot of pride leaking out of the bottom. I remember one day Brad came over, and I was gone. He dropped something off the house, and I get home the next day, and I'm walking down the driveway to check the paper, and I'm thinking, oh, shit, my car's got a leak. I'm, I'm, I pulled the thing in, put it in the garage, put it on jack stands, and I'm looking all underneath trying to find this leak. Well, it wasn't my car. It was his truck. <laughs> and uh, can always tell when Brad's here. <laughs> oh, Spall the stain. That's, right. That's right. all right. That that truck does well. I was going to ask about uh, the GTX has got an interesting uh, thing that's coming up on it relatively soon. Uh, is that still uh, going to occur? It is still going to occur. I decided to delay it for one year, so it's not going to be uh, 2019. It's actually going to be 2020. Um, the rebuild of the car took a little bit longer than I anticipated, so I want to have a little bit of time with the car before I uh, send it on its way to its next owner. But it will be being auctioned off for charity at Barrett-Jackson uh, Scottsdale in 2020, um, and the proceeds are going to go to the Special Operation Warrior Foundation, which is a great charity that ensures the children of fallen warriors go to college. So, That's outstanding. Uh, yeah, great, great charity, um, great event that it's going to be auctioned off at. But uh, yeah, 2019 was just rapidly approaching, and we weren't able to get all of our ducks in a row uh, to get it done this coming Barrett Jackson in Scottsdale. But 2020, it will happen. Well, as a veteran, I just want to say thank you for doing that. That's a, that's a very, very nice gesture that you're doing. You got it, man, and I uh, appreciate your service, and I appreciate all veterans and currently serving members of the military, their service. We've done a lot of work for veterans and also active uh, service members on overhauling, and those episodes always stand out for me, and we're happy to do it because it's a small, small way to say thank you for serving our country. Well, that's awesome. Yeah. Thank you. That's awesome. Thank awesome. you. And with your okay, I mean, if we can put information for for that into the show notes and get that out there for our listeners. Yeah, definitely. For sure. Awesome. Thank you. You know, when, uh, when Alex was going over his leak problem and approaching that in his surgical precision that he always does, <laughs> I couldn't help but notice I, I checked out your IMDB page because, you know, I'm a fan and it was cloudy that day. So the telescope <laughs> didn't work so well. <laughs> you, you've played a number of, really cool kind of just like character roles on just about everything imaginable. I mean, you were yeah. everywhere. But my favorite, my favorite name of a character that stood out to me was Dr. Bonsai Kovacs. Oh, yeah. that was on VIP. <laughs> <laughs> with, uh, with, um, Pamela Anderson. Yeah. Those were in the, uh, the salad days of my career as I like to call it. Uh, yeah, you know, before before I got overhauling from 1995 until 2003, I was an actor. I made a ton of commercials. I was on a lot of different TV shows. Um, and, uh, yeah, VIP, uh, which was Pam Anderson's detective show, um, that, was, that was a lot of fun. I got to play this guy who was a, who was a doctor who was like a surfer. So we shot it down um, by the water in Long Beach and uh, – that was a lot of fun, but man, that was a long time ago. That was <laughs> yeah, I didn't man, want to dig too to far go. back, you know. I wasn't going to go into like, oh, in, in third grade, you played, you know, this part in the Christmas pageant. I didn't want to do that to you, but that was just really cool to see because, I, I mean, I, I knew you were an actor, but it's just funny to go back and kind of look at your roles. I was like, holy crap, you've really had some range, man. You were even yeah. in X-Files. How cool is yeah. that? I'm here, I'm telling you your career. Now I feel like an idiot. The, the show that I get recognized for most besides Overhauling is Two and a Half Men because they show it uh, the most. But yeah, I was uh, I had a very small part in Two and a Half Men, but it was a, a scene with Charlie Sheen. And um, I got to be kind of buddies with Charlie because we were both huge baseball fans. And we shot that in 2003 when the Cubs were in the playoffs. That was unfortunately the Bartman year. <laughs> and Charlie, Charlie let me watch uh, some of the playoff games in his trailer while we were shooting that episode of Two and a Half Men. So we got to become buddies. And then a few years later, we did one of Charlie's friend's cars on overhaul and Tony Todd. 
and uh, Charlie was our insider. So we kind of, you know, reconnected there, and uh, uh, that was that was pretty funny. We were laughing about um, Two and a Half Men and, and the time that we had on that. But, uh, you know, it's amazing. Every once in a while, I get these big residual checks for Two and a Half Men, and I'm like, wow, that was a long time ago, and I'm still getting paid for it. So thank you, CBS, <laughs> and thank you, Two and a Half Men, for uh, giving me a little walking around money every once in a while. <laughs> So how did you get into acting? Like what, what led you to that career? Yeah, I was, uh, I was always kind of into um, theater when I was growing up. Um, when I was a kid, I was always doing plays. And um, in high school, I did a bunch of plays. And in college, I did a couple. So I knew that I wanted to be an actor when I got done with school. And um, I also knew that being an actor is, is a very difficult profession, which is why I went to law school and got that kind of, like I said, that uh, fallback position out of the way. And then yeah. I just uh, started going on auditions and, and trying to make it happen. And, and fortunately, you know, the stars aligned and I was able to scratch out a living until 2003. And then I went on that overhauling audition and that's when my life changed. So cool. So do you have, was there a dream role? I mean, if you could have, if, if somebody would come up to you tomorrow and say, hey, what is your dreams, dream script to have dropped in your lap? Um, you know, I, I, would, I would love to continue in the, in the car genre. I'd love to continue to work with Chip. We're, we're kind of working on a couple different ideas, and, and I think it's been enough time now since Overhaul and Finished that it's time for the two of us to get back on TV, and hopefully we'll do that together. So I can't really say that there's one particular project in mind. I've always kind of let my career come to me. And so it's out there somewhere floating around. And I'm hoping that it's one of the ideas that uh, we're trying to develop. But, you know, right now we're just um, kind of hanging and, and doing what we're doing and, and hoping the next chapter is coming soon. Very cool. Thanks. Okay. So with SEMA coming up, I know you were a busy guy last year. What's on the docket for you this year? Pretty much the same thing as last year. We'll be having the live stage out front and um, a lot of uh, guests and interviews and features. And so I'll be hanging around the live stage a lot. And then other than that, you know, I always try to get inside as much as I can and go see the sites. Um, SEMA just gets bigger and bigger every year. It's really incredible. You know, when we started, I think the first SEMA we did was in 2005. And it was only a couple of the convention halls. And now it's not only all the convention halls, but all the parking lots and the yeah. you know, hotel next door and across the street. I mean, it's it's just amazing. I mean, even if you can't get inside, just coming and checking out everything that's outside is incredible, too. So we'll, we'll be doing more of the same at SEMA this year. Well, maybe we can uh, go back up and do another thing on top of the on top of the crow's nest, you know, because you know what what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. And... Let's do it. I love it. Well, uh, we'll twenty do... bucks is twenty bucks, man. Okay. I'll, make sure to, I'll make sure to nail my read this time. <laughs> nail your read. Yeah, that was a tough one last time. Just go ahead and say it. All right, you. That's it, man. Off the cuff, done. Call it a day. Well, in his defense, he didn't have the best cue cards. Yeah, well. Yeah, none. Yes. <laughs> but apparently he did have the longest arms for the photo, you know, so yeah. that that worked, I guess. Yeah, that too. <laughs> yeah, that SEMA stage was buzzing. That thing never stopped. It was pretty amazing. Yeah, that was really cool. It's always a great experience there. And, you know, obviously that's our audience. So we're, we're speaking right to our audience, which is great. And uh, always <laughs> a lot of fun. And yeah, it just, it's amazing to see the way that it evolves every year. Coming up, you've got the Barrett Jackson in September. So we'll be looking for you for that. Yep. Got yeah, Barrett Jackson and then, and then uh, SEMA in November. And then Barrett Jackson again, Scottsdale in January, which, which like I said, is the big one. That's the granddaddy. So when you're covering uh, Barrett Jackson, I mean, do you, do you get there a couple days early and kind of just recon the place or are you just... Day one, they yeah. drop you. They they helicopter drop you in, and you go. Yeah, they just they push me out of the plane with a parachute and a beer. <laughs> uh, I just you know wherever I land, that's where I start. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you rappel and you. Uh, for, for Vegas, you know we're we're on the air Thursday through Saturday, um, so I get there Tuesday, kind of get the lay of the land, 
check out what's there. Wednesday, we have a production meeting, a little more lay of the land. And then Thursday, we have a production meeting. And then, boom, we hit the air. And uh, so we're, you know, by this point, we're very well streamlined. Everybody kind of knows their roles. Um, we know what's going on. So they give us our, our credentials and we walk around and check out what we want to talk about and what we want to see. And it's, it's pretty much autopilot at this point. It, it works really well. You guys have a really, really excellent production. I mean, it's uh, when, when they're, I, I can imagine the, the guy in the booth that's moving, you know, camera to camera, you know, going to point to point. I mean, it's like whenever they put it on you guys, you guys are ready to roll. And it's, yeah, uh, it's have, impressive. A very, very talented production team, Cavus Productions, and, and they're, they're amazing. I mean, they're very, very experienced in live TV, and we work very well with them. And, you know, we know that uh, we kind of, we got to keep the ball moving and keep it, keep getting it close to the goal line. And they provide us with all of the facilities that we need to do that. And so everybody does their job and it's, it's always a great production. It's a lot, a lot of fun. I love doing it. Barrett Jackson, the four times a year that I do it always, uh, you know, some, some very, very fun, fun experiences. Well, you guys are able to turn a, a show that, you know, that a regular car guy will sit there for six hours and watch, Yeah, you know, it's it's always fun to watch. I'm always doing work around the house, but whenever Barrett Jackson's on, Barrett Jackson's always playing. I mean, I'd be sitting in front of the TV, but it's within earshot. And if I hear something that I'm interested in come across the block, I'll come out and watch the TV. But uh, I'm listening to you guys, if not watching it. It's it's nice. amazing. Appreciate that. And actually, you know, in Scottsdale, there's two days where we do ten hours. So oh. it's uh, it's long, long days in Scottsdale. But you know what? They they fly by because they're so much fun. We're all kids in a candy store at Barrett Jackson. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. I I can't say thanks enough for spending, you know, spending an hour with us. Appreciate it, you guys. I, I'm glad that we were finally able to do this. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing you guys again at, at SEMA in November. I, 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 won't bug you, I won't bug you anymore, man. It's all good. Thank you again <laughs> very much, man. <laughs> you got it. It's great talking to you guys. Thanks, dude. Well, hey, thank you again. Take it easy, boys. I'll Have see you soon. Night. Appreciate All it, Chris. Right, Have a good one. Thanks. You too. Bye. Bye. Thanks again to our guest, and thank you for listening. As always, I'm Brian. I'm still Brad. I'm Alex. And we'll catch you next time. Thanks again. Thanks again for listening, and be sure to keep up with us gearheads over on our website at www.round6pod.com. And if you'd like to, we invite you to follow along with us over on Facebook, Instagram, and be sure to check out all of our latest videos on YouTube.com. <laughs> it, it, it writes itself. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man.